Hello and welcome to ESC TV here in Barcelona at ESC 2022. I'm Dr. Carolyn Lam from Singapore. My great pleasure to be here with Dr. John McMurray from Glasgow. And what we're talking about is, of course, very much in line with the theme of the ESC, the magic of cardiology and the magic of the SGLT2 inhibitors. We're going to talk about wonder drugs and heart failure and beyond, <laughs> but I'm going to just shoot some hopefully tough questions and just get to the point, okay? Okay, First I'm of ready. All, <laughs> <laughs> so John, in heart failure, do SGLT2 inhibitors work across the spectrum of ejection fraction? You said you were going to ask me a tough question. That's an easy question. So the answer is unequivocally yes. So why the confusion before? How do we reconcile it now? Well, the started? only confusion, if there really was confusion, arose from a post hoc analysis of the Emperor Preserved trial, which seemed to show some attenuation of benefit in people with a completely normal ejection fraction. And I think that was always potentially spurious. In fact, we know that further analyses showed that if you cut ejection fraction at 65% versus 60%, you didn't see that. It never made any sense. I, I wrote an editorial about this saying it didn't make sense. We can understand why neurohumeral modulating agents perhaps show attenuation of benefits in people with a normal ejection fraction, but it made no sense to see that in people getting an SGLT2 inhibitor. Plus the fact that I suppose the P for interaction for heterogeneity in the pre-specified subgroup analysis no, of Emperor not. Preserve was neutral. If we looked at the P for interaction across the continuous EF, it was neutral. So Nothing. there's room to sort of wonder if the prior finding could have been by chance and deliver. And we now know it was by chance and, and that always was, I think, likely to be the case. So signed, sealed and delivered on that point, but why do you think we could have expected the neurohormonal therapies? You wrote that beautiful editorial, Reemergence of Normal Ejection Fraction Heart Failure. So why the difference? Are they acting differently? Because going back to the days of the SOLVED trial, SOLVED treatment, SOLVED prevention, uh, in the SOLVED registry, there were patients included who had an ejection fraction above 40% and they showed less neurohumeral activation than patients with an ejection fraction below 40%. And we know that from one or two other smaller studies. So as your ejection fraction increases, neurohumeral activation decreases. So of course, drugs that are acting on neurohumeral systems are clearly going to have more benefit when you've got more neurohumeral activation and they're clearly not going to be as effective if you've got less neurohumeral activation. SGLT2 inhibitors don't, as far as we know, work through neurohumeral systems. Therefore, we would not have expected to see that same attenuation. Thanks. And of course, that next tough question, how do they work? <laughs> so that is the tough question. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, so you've heard me say this before. In some senses, I don't care because all I want to know is that they do work, that they do help people. Uh, I think we've all been saying at this meeting, we don't really know how any of our drugs work. There's lots and lots of speculation. Um, everybody's favorite, I think, is that it's something to do with the diuretic action. And I think that may be true to some extent, might be true in certain clinical situations, so in somebody who's more congested, more acutely decompensated, uh, may be a short-term benefit as opposed to a longer-term benefit, but I don't think it's the, the whole explanation. And probably to preempt one of your questions, I would always say we need to remember the kidney because we've neglected the kidney in patients with heart failure, and I just find it hard to believe that their renal benefits haven't got something to do with their benefits in heart failure. That is exactly where <laughs> we were going to go because um, it is very important that even 
we in heart failure are very aware of the renal protective effects going beyond heart failure, as, as the theme says. So could you maybe, you know, really top line summarize for us the renal protective effects of these medications, even in heart failure? Sure. Well, so we can look at renal protection in a number of ways. One very powerful way is to look at what we call the EGFR slopes. So unfortunately our GFR declines as we get older year on year and patients with heart failure typically have a two to three fold faster decline in rate of EGFR than an age and sex match person in the general population and SGLT2 inhibitors substantially reduce that rate of decline in fact return it almost to what you would expect in, in age-matched controls. So that's one way to look at it. But then, of course, maybe the more important way mm. is to look at what we might call hard renal events. So mm. development of end-stage kidney disease, requirement for renal replacement therapy, uh, death from renal causes, and SGLT2 inhibitors, again, substantially reduce that risk in heart failure patients and in chronic kidney disease patients. And, Again, we forget how lucky we are. We're used to talking about trials that show these major benefits and hard outcomes. Yeah. We're even used to talking about trials that show reduction in mortality. In the renal community, the first ever treatment to show a reduction in all-cause mortality was an SGLT2 inhibitor in the DAPA CKD trial. Ah. They'd never seen that before. Ah. So we, we take so much for granted and it's amazing to see the impact that these drugs have had outside cardiology. Wow, so you know what John, that's also a very familiar story because in the diabetes world, <laughs> the first time they also had positive cardiovascular outcomes was again with the SGLT2 inhibitor. So could you now, you know, going beyond heart failure treatment to talk about heart failure prevention. Mm -hmm. So. How, how far are we supposed to use these medications now and what, where, where are the remaining questions? So, very good question. So, obviously, as you pointed out, we've now got multiple trials showing that in patients with type 2 diabetes, we can substantially yes. 30, 40 percent reductions in risk of incident heart failure. Now, the question is, does that benefit extend outside patients with type 2 yeah. diabetes? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it must, but we don't have that evidence. Oh How would we test that? Well, probably in the most obvious group to look at are patients after myocardial infarction. And there are two ongoing trials doing just that, including patients with and without type 2 diabetes. There may be other ways to look at that as well. So, so uh, that to me is the, the next frontier for SGLT2 inhibitors. Wow. Okay. Maybe one more beyond question, going beyond the outpatient setting into the in-hospital setting. Is that question dead too? Can we start <laughs> SGLT2 inhibitors in the hospital? Of course. So again, we've had conversations like this before. I've never believed in that dichotomy between in-hospital and out-of-hospital. I can have heart failure on Monday and be walking around in the community and on Thursday I can be in the hospital and by the following Thursday be home again. I'm the same patient with the same condition and I'm just being treated in a different place. And of course we should use SGLT2 inhibitors in hospital but to be more serious and to answer your question uh, because it is a very important question, we have good evidence now. We've got one big trial and one smaller trial showing that you can start SGLT2 inhibitors safely in hospital. That was a concern at one point about these drugs. And not only that, but they are effective uh, within as little as 90 days of starting treatment in that population. And of course, that's a great opportunity to start these drugs. You've got these people who've declared themselves at very high risk, very vulnerable. You know when they go home, they're at high risk of death, high risk of being readmitted. A hospital's a great opportunity to start 
these life-saving treatments. And if you do have concerns about starting treatments, then hospitals are a great place to observe your patient. And if you believe you have to monitor kidney function, electrolytes, a great place to do that as well. So use that critical opportunity to help your patients. Right, and those fears of having a very sick patient and precipitating DKA, ketoacidosis, um, and so on, acute kidney injury, we can rest assured? So acute kidney injury is reduced actually by nearly half with these drugs and DKA is really only a concern in patients with diabetes treated with insulin and in fact really in people with diabetes treated with insulin who have their insulin withheld or the dose reduced. So yes, you always need to think about DKA but generally if you come in with decompensated heart failure you come in volume overloaded. You're not particularly sick. Nobody stops your insulin. Yeah. It's maybe different if you're admitted with acute uh, cholecystitis, uh, you're going for surgery, you have your insulin withheld, you're not eating. That's the type of patient who gets DKA, but not, not our patients. And the trials prove that. Solovus worsening heart failure was the canary in the coal mine trial, 1,200 patients, type 2 diabetes, many of them on insulin, all treated either in hospital or within three days of discharge. There was no excess of DKA. Thank you so much, John. On a personal note, thank you for leading these trials. So, well, so amazing. You're, I mean, you, you're you part really of it as well, Carolyn. <laughs> a role model to all of us trialists, and you know, just incredible the number of simultaneous publications that came with Deliver. So grateful, pointing all the audience, beautiful publications out there. Please get a hold of them. This is really a moment that we should celebrate that we've got a very effective therapy that goes from prevention to treatment of heart failure, treatment of ejection fraction, whether it's high or low, even treating the kidneys and heart failure. What a time to celebrate. So thank you very much for joining us here on ESC TV.